start at videotape number three. We're back on the record. The time is 3.26. Doctor, can you understand you're still under oath? Yes. Now, based on the medications you have listed on Exhibit 9, which ones of those did you prescribe to Tara? Norco and Cymbalta. Based on the medications that Tara provided to you, strike that. Did Tara ask you whether or not the various medications she was taking uh, were at all problematic in the combinations she was taking them? No, she did not ask. Did you order any lab work for her? Yes. What lab work did you order? Thyroid function tests. Anything else? No. Now, why did you order thyroid function test? She actually mentioned that she wanted to... It's been a while since her thyroid function tests were checked, and she would like to know how her thyroid is. Now, under physical examination, the language that you have there just tracks the language from the previous two examinations, is that correct? Yes. And then under assessments, the first one is the same as the other two, is that correct? Yes. And the second one, you did not update it from the second time. Is that fair to say? Yes. Because you had already increased it to 60. Yes. Was it your intent to increase it above 60? No. And then number three, that is something new, correct? Yes. And could you read what that says? Unspecified hypothyroidism continue levothyroxine and cytomel. What made you believe that she had unspecified hypothyroidism? Because she was on the medication that helped the thyroid function. So besides being on that medication, did she have any symptoms to indicate that she had that? No. Then underneath that is another paragraph. And this is somewhat, well, let's go through it. The first sentence remains the same, correct? This is a 30-year-old female with underlying psychiatric mood disorder who present with severe myalgias and arthralgias consistent with fibromyalgia. That's the same as? Yes. Correct? The next sentence, I had a very long discussion with the patient and her boyfriend regarding fibromyalgia management. Is that the same? Yes. And did you have a long discussion or was that just left over from the first session? I spent some time with Hjor and David. Yeah. Would you characterize that as a very long discussion or was that just left over from the first session? Asked and answered, go ahead. I'm sure it was left over, but I did talk to them. Okay, also. thank you. I strongly discourage her from the use of narcotics and recommend pool therapy and treatment with some Balta to be started at 30 milligrams daily and to be, okay, and that's, that's also that's left over. That's carried over. Okay. So, so far everything's been carried over, correct? Yes. Okay. 
Discuss with patient that her anxiety needs to be managed better. Is that something new or carried over? Seems new. Yeah, it is new, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Yes. What, what made you add that to the assessment? Because she was very anxious about surgery and pain and focused a lot on her pain during the appointment, Did pain you, management. I'm sorry. Did you suggest to her how she should manage that anxiety better? I told her that Dr. Bond, her psychiatrist, should be involved. What else did you tell her about that? No. Okay. You don't recall? No, I think I mentioned to her the psychotherapy should help. Okay, so it says psychotherapy referral is given. What does that mean? There are psychologists who also spend time talking to patients about their needs. Did she say something to you other than she was worried about the pain from her surgery that would cause you to tell her that she should receive psychotherapy? She, I, no, I don't recall that. But she was anxious, so. But she was anxious the first two visits and you didn't recommend a psychotherapist, correct? She was more irritable. Okay. Anything, <coughs> excuse me, any other reason you recommended psychotherapy besides she was more anxious and more irritable? Um, yes, during the appointment her phone was ringing and um, she became irritable during the appointment actually. She became irritable during the appointment because her phone kept ringing? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Any other reasons then that you suggested psychotherapy referral other than the ones you've already listed? No. So did you give her the name of a physician? I think so. Who did you recommend? I don't remember. Is there someone that you commonly refer patients to for psychotherapy? Uh, not commonly, no. The secretaries have some cards, so they gave some names. So do you recall going to your secretary and getting names of psychotherapists and giving it to her? Not going, I don't remember, but asking them to get some information for her, yes. Okay. Post-operative pain needs to be controlled by the surgeon. What does that mean? That means what it says, that the surgeon... Why did you put that in your notes? Because she was concerned about her post-operative pain and I said that will be handled when she has actually is having a surgery and after that. Did she ask you to provide her pain medication for her surgery? Yes. And what did you tell her? She was out of the medication so I said I'll give her some medication to control her pain now and until she gets someone else to help also. Okay. And the medication you gave her was enough for the next four weeks? I think so. Did you tell her that she should uh, discontinue pain medication before her surgery? No. Did you tell her it was okay for her to continue to take it up to her surgery? She was in pain, so she, I don't remember exactly the wording, but she, yes, she was in pain and she was taking it. And you didn't tell her to discontinue it prior to her surgery? To stop pain medication? Yes. No. Okay. And as to the Cymbalta, did you instruct her to do anything with that other than to seek psychiatric consultation? No, I told her, oh, she told me she had a psychiatrist, so I told her to get her psychiatrist involved. As to whether or not to cease taking it? Yes. And your best recollection today is that she was taking it at the time? Yes. But she had considered 
discontinuing taking it before her surgery based on what the plastic surgeon or the anesthesiologist told her? Yes. Mm. Cervical trigger points are injected. Is that the same as, that sentence the same as the proceeding? The sentence is the same and it was done, yes. And did you do trigger point injections? Yes. And then below it says, I will see the patient in two weeks, follow up, et cetera? Yes. Now down below it says a four week follow up. So did you just uh, forget to change that to four weeks? Yes. Okay. And then it's written, thank you very much for referring this patient to me. Did you send Dr. Rahman a letter based on this third visit? Probably not. We only sent the initial consultation. This was just some language that yes. you didn't change from the second report? Yes. Under treatment, others, start Percocet. Can you read that? Start Percocet tablet 10 slash 325 milligrams orally 0.5 tablets as needed every six hours. Did you discuss with her changing her PED medication from Norco to Percocet? Yes, she said that Norco was not working as effectively anymore. What made you decide to use Percocet, to prescribe Percocet? It's a little stronger. Anything else? No. And why did you give her, strike that, are there lesser dosages than 10-325 you could have given her? There are less dosages. It comes in less dosages. What's a lesser dosage than 10-325? 5. 5-325? Yes. Okay. Anything less than that? No. So there was only one lesser dosage than 10-325, correct? Yes. And you also recommended a half a tablet every six hours, is that correct? Yes. Is there a, a, a lesser quantity other than a half a tablet every six hours that you could have prescribed? Not sure of the question. I, when you manage pain, you have to do something that corresponds to the previous management. So you have to adjust the pain medication accordingly. You cannot give her the smallest dose of the medication that she is already failing. Under preventative medicine? Yes. Is uh, the first sentence under counseling, is that new? From the second and first reports? It looks new. Why did you decide to, well actually, why did you decide to include this in this report? Because it's been a third time she had trigger point injections. Usually pe patients don't develop side effects from the first. So it's been a third time she had trigger point injections. That's why it's added, the potential side effect. How often can you treat someone with trigger point injections? Relax foundation, vague and ambiguous, go ahead. It depends on the individual. So for someone like Tara, how many times could you treat her? I would not give her injections every two weeks for years, but initially at the treatment, it's appropriate. Could you do it for several months? Mm, I wouldn't do it for every two weeks or for several months, no. <clears throat> Spend more than 40 minutes with patient on counseling. Now, why did you put that in this report in the time you spent with the patient for the other visits was not included. It was a longer visit. This one? Yes. 
Well, the first visit lasted about an hour and 15 minutes, correct? Right, but that's expected. It's the first visit. Okay. So this visit was more than 40 minutes. Was it closer to an hour? Probably 45 minutes, I, I guess. Do you code your visits based on the number of, uh, the, the amount of time you spend with the patients? Yes. Was one of the reasons you put the amount of time down was for coding purposes? Yes. Called patient psychiatrist, Dr. Paul Bone at and then left a number uh, at and then there's a number and then it says left a message. Did you put that down? Yes. Why did you put that down? Because I called him. Why did you call him? Because she was instructed to go off her antidepressants and I didn't think it was right to do without the involving her psychiatrist. So that's the reason I called him. When did you call him? I think during the visit. Were you concerned about her going off her antidepressants? Yes. Why did you not just simply leave it to her to call her psychiatrist about whether or not she should get off the Cymbalta? Because her surgery was within two or three days, I believe, from my visit. Right. So she didn't have anything scheduled with him to, you know, consult before that. But you're aware that she had his phone number. She could have called the office herself to ask, correct? Yes, correct. In fact, she provided you with his phone number. Yes. Okay. So you called Dr. Bone. Did you call him at his office or on his cell phone? I honestly don't know if that's the office number or his cell phone. Okay. And when you called, did you speak to anybody? No, no one picked up. Did you leave a message? Yes. What message did you leave? I don't remember everything, but I think I mentioned that she was seen and she was planning to have an elective surgery. She was scheduled and the instructions she was given is to go off antidepressants. What else? That's all I remember. So you called, you left a message saying that you were seeing his patient, that she was having elective surgery, and that she was instructed to go off antidepressants. Yes. Did you say anything else in your message? I don't remember. Did you know whether or not Dr. Bone was aware if Tara was taking Cymbalta? I don't know. Did you ask Tara that? I don't remember. I believe so, but I don't remember. You believe you asked Tara if Dr. Bone knew if she was taking Cymbalta? Yes. Did you not trust Tara to call Dr. Bone on his own to ask about Cymbalta? As her physician, I was caring, so I can't tell that I didn't. She seemed to be overwhelmed with the move, with auditions, with financial stress, with surgery. So that was one of the things. So you were calling to help her out? Yes. And is that something you did because you thought it was very important to speak to the doctor about? I thought it was important that he's involved, yes. Did you leave your phone number? Yes, I'm sure. Did you leave your name? I think so. During your phone message with Dr. Bone, did you at all indicate that Tara had mentioned to you that she wanted to kill herself? I don't believe so. Well, that is something you would remember, correct? I can tell you what I remember. Right. So my question to you is, 
Did you tell Dr. Bone that you believe, strike that, did you tell Dr. Bone that Tara told you that she wanted to kill herself? I don't remember that wording. Did you say words to that effect? I don't remember that. Is it possible? I know how it came up. Is it but possible? But I don't think I left it on the message, no. My question to you, is it possible that you told Dr. Bone in his message that Tara told you that she wanted to kill herself? Asked and answered now three times. Go ahead, Doctor. It's possible, but I don't remember it saying that. You remember during your consultation with Tara that she told you she wanted to kill herself, correct? No. She never told you that? That came up when her phone was ringing. Did Tara tell you during her consultation mm -hmm. that she wanted to kill herself? I don't remember that. She was in so much pain that probably how it came up, but I, I think that she wanted to kill herself, no. So it came out or it didn't come out that she told you, doctor, I'm in so much pain, I want to kill myself. That's possible. She did say that, didn't she? Probably. She did say that, didn't she? That's the third time. I just told that's that's an answer. Do you have a specific recollection, not a probable recollection, mm -hmm. but do you have a specific recollection that when Tara sat in her office with you, she told you that she wanted to kill herself? No. You don't remember that? No. You are a liar. Oh, okay. <laughs> How? It's so, so inappropriate. So many times she's said anything on that. Is her phone muted? Because we don't need any more interruptions. Just like we don't need your Okay, 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 okay. When Tara saw you, she appeared desperate, didn't she? She appeared anxious and irritable. She also appeared desperate, didn't she? Asked and answered. It was an answer. Well, okay, go ahead. Please answer the question. Anxious and irritable, she did not look Your Honor, desperate. Your Excuse me, she hadn't, Mr. Brown, she hadn't finished her answer. Go she ahead. did not what? She did not appear desperate. Okay. Thank you. During the time that Tara visited you and she told you that she wanted to kill herself, you told her that was a very, very serious statement. Isn't that true? Let me object that it assumes facts not in evidence and contradicts her earlier okay, testimony. Right. Right. You, you can answer. Your phone was ringing and she was very irritable and she told David tell her to stop calling or why does she keep calling she was very irritable and that's when she mentioned when that's when David mentioned or maybe you shouldn't tell her that you wanted to kill yourself she wouldn't be calling that's how it came up your honor can I get an instruction to answer the question I was pending okay. well you gave a lot of information read the question back please Thank you. During the time that Tara visited you, when she told you that she wanted to kill herself, you told her that it was a very, very serious statement. Isn't that true? No. I actually asked her, this is a very serious statement when David said that sentence, and I asked her if she has any intentions of hurting herself or others, and she said no. She said more. She said, no, I want to leave. Please, please. We're going to take a little break. You need to. Linda? Okay, we're going to take a break. Let's go off the record. Off the record, please. Yeah. 15. Kind of
Linda, we're going to hang up. Back on the record, 402. During your visit with Tara, the third visit, on the 21st, 22nd actually, you stated that David mentioned to you that Tara had been hospitalized before? For a psychiatric condition? I don't re remember that. I'm sorry? I don't remember that. Okay. Is, is any of that in front of you? Yeah, the water bottle. Can you move oh, that? Sure. Just, thank you. What do you recall David telling you during this third visit? About anything? I remember the phone calls. Phone they, calls from who? Who? From Tara's mother. Okay. And this was to David or to Tara? Well, I don't know which whose phone was ringing. Okay. It was. I thought it was Tara's phone. I don't know. Okay. Um, and did David say something in response to Tara's phone ringing from her mother? She was irritable because it was interrupting the visit and she said, why does she keep calling? And that's when he said, maybe if you didn't tell her you wanted to kill yourself, she wouldn't be calling. Now, how did you know it was Tara's mother calling? It came up in the conversation. Okay. So David told Tara, if you didn't tell her that you wanted to kill yourself, she wouldn't keep calling. Are you saying that David was, the her David was referring to was David's, that uh, David was referring to was Tara's mother? Yes. Okay. And what else did David say? Or did Tara respond? I don't remember exactly what she responded. I asked her. So at that point, was there a response by Tara? I don't remember the wording. Uh, she was very annoyed. Do you remember in general if Tara made a response to David's comment? I don't. Okay. So once you heard David saying that comment to Tara about what she had talked to her mother about earlier, about wanting to kill herself, did you say anything to Tara? Yes, I asked her if she had any intention of hurting herself or others, and she denied. She said, no, I want to, I want to live. Check my thyroid. Why does that comment not appear in your progress report? Because that was the you mean the whole entire conversation? No, the comment where David mentioned that Tara had told her mom she wanted to kill herself. Mm -hmm. And you asking Tara, do you want to kill yourself? And Tara saying no. Why isn't any of that contained in your progress report? Because she denied it. Is that the only reason? I documented what I, you know, the important things and some of it does not get documented in the progress note. But. Did you believe that it was an important factor that Tara's fiance had mentioned during your visit that Tara had told her mother she wanted to commit suicide? She wanted to kill herself, yes. 
but she also denied it during the visit. But, but my question to you is, do you believe that was an important piece of information? Yes, it's important. And you try to put important pieces of information in your progress report, correct? Yes. So, when you were describing earlier, asking Tara if she had an intention to hurt herself or hurt others, she responded, I want to live? Yes. And then she also said in the same breath, pretty much, I want my thyroid tested? Yes. What did you say in response to Tara when she told you I want to live, I want my thyroid tested. I said we'll check the thyroid test. I'm sorry, we'll check the lab test. And isn't it true that one of the main reasons you called Dr. Bone was to ask him or to discuss with him Tara's comment that she wanted to kill herself. Objection, argumentative. Go ahead, you can respond. She was anxious, and the main reason the phone call was made was because she was taking off her medications. And they, we had that conversation, so that's one of the important reasons, too. Okay. Can you read back my question, please? No, the main reason was to involve him into her care. Now, after you came back to the room, strike that, did you call Dr. Bone from the examination room? I don't remember. Is that something you would have likely done or not done? Probably. Okay. So you believe you called from inside the room? Probably. With, with David and Tara present? Yes, probably. Okay. Did you leave your office number with Dr. Bone? I left a number. It might have been my office or my cell. Did you also leave your home and cell number with him? I don't leave my home number ever, so probably not. So do you believe you left both your cell phone and your office number with him? Likely. Because it was an important reason you were calling him, correct? Yes. Did Tara tell you that the pain she was experiencing was worse than she had ever felt before? I don't remember the wording. Do you remember in general, she told you that the pain she was experiencing was the worst that she ever <laughs> felt before? Asked and answered, go ahead. I don't remember the wording. She was in a lot of pain. M my question is not do you remember the specific wording, it's just in general. Do you remember in general her telling you that she was experiencing pain that she had never felt before, and she couldn't take it. I don't remember that. Okay. After you had this discussion with Tara, and then you made the phone call to Dr. Bone and left a message. Is it at that time you administered the shots to her trigger points? Yes.
Tara told you that the Norco that you prescribed to her and that she was taking was losing its effectiveness, correct? Yes. Is that common? It depends on the state of chronic pain or fibromyalgia or for the reason why a patient is taking it. Were you surprised that she told you the Norco was no longer relieving the pain? She was under more stress, so it's reasonable that she had more pain triggered by stress. So that was to be expected? It's a possibility. Did Tara express any concern over the mix of medication she was taking? No. Did Tara express any concern over the medication she was taking when combined with the anesthesia she would undertake? No, she didn't. Did you ask Tara whether she had taken um, Percocet before? I don't remember. Is that something you normally ask patients before prescribing to them a pain medication? Usually. Is Percocet the same as oxycodone? Yes. Yes? Yes. Is it the same as Norco? It's a little stronger than Norco. Now, if you turn to page 15 of Exhibit 9, your follow-up for her was four weeks, is that correct? Yes. Why did you want to see her in four weeks? Because she was under treatment. Why not two weeks? Because she was supposed to have a surgery. Right? And why did you not want to see her in two weeks? She was supposed to have a surgery, so she was going to deal with all the other physicians and post-operative pain. And so because she had surgery planned, then you didn't feel it was necessary to have her undertake an office visit until four weeks from then. Is that correct? Yes, but if there is a problem, patients call and we work them in. On the last page, is that a copy of a prescription that you wrote? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us what it says? It says Percocet 10 slash 325, one tap POQ six hours, PRNP number 100, no refills. So you were prescribing 100 count, correct? Yes. And how long should that last her? If she takes it as directed? Yes. About three weeks. Now, once you learned that she was exceeding the dosage that you prescribed, did that concern you at all? Let me just object that I misstates her testimony assumes facts not in evidence that she was exceeding the dose. Well, let me uh -huh. rephrase that. In your second office visit, you had prescribed Norco to her, correct? Yes. And do you recall how often you wrote her prescription for, how often she should take it? I believe every six hours. Why, why don't you look at Exhibit 7, just so we're certain, and turn to the last page. Every six. Every six hours, and how, how many should she take? She should take one as needed every six hours. 
And she told you during her third visit that she was taking two pills every six hours, correct? Yes. Right. Now, after you learned that she was taking twice as much Norco as you prescribed, did you counsel her against doing that? Yes. What did you say to her? I don't remember the exact wordings. Tell us in general what you, would, what you said to her. That she should take medications as prescribed. Can you read that back? That she should take medication as prescribed. Did you tell her that she shouldn't take more than what you prescribed for her? Yes. And what did she say in response? I don't recall exactly what she said. So at that point, did you believe it was possible that you had a patient here who was taking more medication than prescribed? It's possible. Okay. Because in your practice, have you come across patients who misuse prescription drugs by taking more than the prescription sets forth? Rarely. But you've come across patients like that, correct? Yes. You've heard as a physician that sometimes people take pain medications which exceed the dosage that their doctors tell them. Yes. That's not surprising to you? No. Okay. And if you have a potential patient who exceeds, who you know exceeds the dosage of pain medication that you prescribe, have you ever taken any actions to try to prevent that from happening? Let me just object on relevance and lax foundation. Go ahead. She did not act as a drug-seeking person. She subjected herself to trigger point injections, which are very painful at every single visit. She did not act as she was drug-seeking. Even if someone doesn't act as if they're drug-seeking, have you ever come across people who nonetheless take more pain medication than they should? Yes. And when you learn that you're faced with a patient who does that, are there steps that you take to prevent that from happening? Relevance and lacking foundation. Go ahead. We instruct the front office not to refill the medications without an appointment or too soon. So you instruct the front office not to, not to allow a refill? Yes. Okay, what else? If we know of other physicians giving the medications, we instruct the patient to only get the pain medication from one physician. Anything else? Those are the main things I would do. What are some of the other things that you do that you don't consider the main things that would prevent a patient from taking more pain medication than you prescribe? Counseling, talking to patients' families, Anything else? No. Okay. Have you ever limited the number of pills you've given a patient that you find takes too many of them for pain relief? Can you rephrase the question? Sure. Let me give you an example. If you're confronted with a patient like Tara, who takes <coughs> twice as much pain medication as you prescribed, have you ever limited the number, the quantity of pills that you prescribe? For example, instead of giving 100, you, maybe you give 25. 
Sometimes, rarely if I think they're drug addicts. Okay, so at times if you think they're taking more pills than you prescribe, then you will limit the number, total number of pills in that prescription for them. It's possible. Well, have you done that? I don't have a lot of drug abusing patients in my practice, but I've You're, done it once or twice. Okay, so once or twice you've limited it. So that the patient has to come back to you and say, doctor, I need another prescription, correct? Right. And you've done that once or twice. Right. When did, when did you do, did you do that before February 2010 in your practice? I don't remember. Or did you do it after February 2010? I don't remember. You have no idea? I don't remember. Okay. The dates. And you've done it once or twice, correct? Yeah. And do you recall possibly. what pen, I'm sorry? Possibly, yes. So you possibly have done it once or twice? or you have done it once or twice? It's not my customary practice to do that. I'll accept that it's not your customary practice. Let's put that aside. Your testimony was that you did it once or twice in your practice. Do you recall that? Yes. And you stand by that? Yeah. Okay. The one or two times that you've done it, do you recall for what pain medication it was for? Vicodin. Was it for anything else? Vicodin and, or Norco, I don't remember. Okay, Vicodin or Norco. And do you recall what number, what quantity of pain medication you made the prescription for when you were trying to limit it for patients who abused your direction as to how many they should take? You have to give them an amount of medication that is sufficient until they can see another doctor if you refuse to see them in the future. So that probably was one instance. Okay. So you have to supply them with some medication until they get help. <coughs> so let me see if I understand this. The one or two instances where you limited the quantity of a patient's pain medication because they were taking too much of it you were discontinuing seeing that patient? Yes, if I have a strong suspicion for a patient not being compliant, yes. So, in those one or two instances you had discontinued or were discontinuing your treatment of that patient? Yes. Okay. And so, you were only giving them enough medication until they had an opportunity to see another physician? Yes. And my question to you is, how many pills would that be? Or strike that, how many days worth of pills would that be? Two or three weeks. So you would give them three weeks worth of pills until they had an opportunity to find another physician? Yes. Okay. And by giving them two or three weeks worth of pills, in your opinion, you are limiting the quantity of pain medication you were giving them? Correct? Yes. Did you explain to Tara the difference in the feeling between Norco and Percocet? I don't remember that. Do you recall giving Tara the written prescription for Percocet? Yes. Do you have a specific recollection of that? No, but it's here. Do you recall saying anything to Tara in particular 
when you handle when you hand it to her the Percocet prescription? I don't. You don't recall or you didn't say anything? I don't remember. Right. Do you recall telling Tara as you handed her the written prescription, now Tara, I want you to make me a promise that you're not going to hurt yourself with this, or words to that effect? I might have said it. And do you recall what Tara said to you? She denied any intentions of hurting herself. Do you recall Is a prescription of a hundred Percocet to you something you regularly do in your practice of medicine? Objection relevance. Go ahead, you can answer. It's a general question. Yes, it is. <laughs> I do write prescriptions for a hundred pills. Is it common for you to prescribe a hundred Percocet in your practice? It's not frequent, but it's common. How frequent would you say you prescribe 100 Percocet to patients in your practice? It depends on the individual, their pain level, their medication tolerance. Would it be fair to say that you don't do that frequently? Not frequently, okay. but commonly. Now, when you handled, strike that, when you handed Tara the prescription of 100 Percocet and you asked her to promise you that she was not going to hurt herself with a prescription, did you view it as a possibility that she could? No. She was there with her boyfriend and she denied it to both of us. When you listen to Dr. Bone's message, did it say that if this was an urgent issue or emergency that he provided another number where he could be reached? I don't remember that. One thing you mentioned to Tara during the third visit, which you didn't mention, <coughs> excuse me, in the first two, was that she needed to see a pain management doctor. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Do you need to check on that? Or? Sure. That would be under the assessment <coughs> section, Exhibit 9. It's about a little bit below the middle of that paragraph. Yes. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And that was something that you put in your progress notes for the first time. Yes? Yes. Okay. 
Why did you put that in your progress notes? Because the treatment was not adequate. She was still in pain. So she, I recommended that she would see pain management for better managing her pain. And was that before or after you gave her the prescription for 100 Percocet? The prescriptions we usually give at the end of the visit, so probably before. <coughs> Did you give her any referral to a pain management physician? I don't remember. Was it your practice to give names of pain management specialists? No, there is a pain management clinic, pain center at Cedar sinai so that's where usually patients go to. Do you believe you recommended that to Tara? I believe so. Is a pain management doctor a specialty? Yes, it's subspecialty. And is there certification in pain management? Probably, yes. Yes. Do you consider yourself a pain management doctor? No. When did you realize, strike that, did you realize after or during the second visit, strike that, did you realize during the second visit that Tara needed a pain management doctor for treatment? No, I think during the second visit she reported some progress. During the third visit, did she report progress as to the injections? I believe so, but it didn't last as long as I would hope for. If you are ever concerned about the quantity of pain medication that a patient of yours may be taken, do you ever post-date prescriptions for the patient? Post-date? Post-date. Uh, no. Do you understand what, what that means? Okay. For example, today is July 16th. If you saw your attorney in your office for pain and you were concerned that he was abusing the pain medication and you're worried about giving him a hundred Percocet, have you ever, for example, given a patient 25 prescription for 25 Percocet for today, possibly another prescription dated for a week from today for another 25 Percocet, and maybe two weeks from today, a third prescription, so that he does not have all 75 Percocet at one time, but has them over a three week period. Do you no, understand that? I understand, but no. Never done that? No. Okay. And you're not familiar with that either, I take it, correct? No. Okay. If there are instances where you are concerned that a patient may be taking more pain medication than you prescribe, have you ever requested that a patient's family member administer the medications to prevent that person from taking more than you prescribe? Vague, ambiguous, lax foundation. Go ahead. I don't remember. 
Do you understand the procedure I'm discussing? Yes. Okay. Is that something you have ever done in your practice? I don't think so. Marking next in order. Yeah. Ten. Okay. Thank you. In marking as exhibit eleven. Let's first look at Exhibit 11. And keep these two next to each other. It would be going back and forth, at least initially. Do you recall, we'll strike that. Exhibit 11 appears to be a July 30th, 2010 letter from Jack Osborne to you. Is that correct? Yes. Do you recall receiving this letter? Yes. And is the letter, you received this letter by registered mail, is that correct? Probably. Okay. And after you received this letter, what did you do? I probably called my malpractice insurance. Okay. Did you gather the client's file, the patient's file? What do you mean, did you gather? It's available and accessible. In the last, the second to the last paragraph, second to last sentence says, therefore the special administrator requests that all medical records The special administrator requests that all medical records currently in your possession or under your control be forwarded to Catherine C. McBroom, attorney at law, at the Los Angeles office address above. Do you see that? Yes. Did you comply with that request? Yes. How did you comply with that request? The records were sent. Did you gather the records? Or did you ask somebody to do so? The medical records did. Turning then to Exhibit 10, is, is this your compliance with is this your compliance with uh, the request contained in Exhibit 11? Yes. Okay, you answer. Do you want to take a moment and look at Exhibit 10 to be sure if these are the materials that you forwarded over in response to Exhibit 11? Uh, hang on. That question infers that she forwarded as opposed to medical records. So um, and it lacks foundation and is contrary to her prior testimony. I think she turned it over to the medical records is what she's testified to. Okay. Let's see what her testimony is, Counselor. Yeah. That is it's all right. Just take a look at yeah. that, and he'll ask you a question in a minute. Yes, it was prepared by medical records. And did you direct, direct them then to produce it? Yes. Now, can you tell us why the copies of the prescriptions you wrote you did not produce pursuant to Exhibit 11. 
Again, counsel, she's told you medical records department produced it, yeah. not Dr. Shansky. All right, you've stated your objection. If you can restructure your question. Did you instruct your medical records department to provide documents in the file to Catherine McBroom? Yes. Were the prescriptions in the file at the time? I don't think so. Where were they if they were not in the file? There is a second, there is a copy of this original prescription and the girls, each individual secretaries have those. So they were, I'm thinking they were there, not here. Well, don't guess, because I don't want you to guess or speculate. Yeah, okay. just here. Right. He knows, he knows that. <laughs> so you believe, strike that. So do you or do you not keep copies of prescriptions in the file? Yes, we do. Do you have any explanation then why they were not done so in this instance? Lax Foundation, go ahead. I've already mentioned we were transitioning from paper charts to electronic medical records. So some of the things were kept as a copy, as a paper, those were the duplicates. And this is all electronic. Well, that's not entirely true, is it? Let me turn your attention to this page of the exhibit? Okay. Let me, before you go on with the question, it's argumentative, at least the beginning part, so can you rephrase, please? No. Where are we looking? I don't It's this one, Your Honor. I'll You're identify as soon as she can okay. find it. Your Honor, he started the question. Well, I understand. He, it's argumentative. It's so improper. I, there's no question yeah. yet. So, no. Do you have that? Yes. Now, this is a fax cover sheet, correct? Yes. So it's not a document that's electronically generated, correct? Correct. Okay. So why would this, so this file contains non-electronically generated documents. Is that true? Yes, that's what she brought with her. I'm sorry? That's what the patient brought and that was scanned in the records. Is your fax number 310-829-1440? No. No. So this is a photocopy of a scanning that was in your computer? Yes. And so is it or is it not your practice to have the prescription scanned and put in the file? Asked and answered. Right, let's clarify it. Go ahead. Because they weren't produced initially. Let's just clarify it. She's okay. told them three times. Go ahead, Dr. Shinsky. Not all prescriptions were scanned, or most of the prescriptions, I should say, probably were not scanned at this transition period to the electronic medical records, but the triplicates copies are usually, you know, held in the separate folder for all the patients. One secretary handles all of those prescriptions. They're not attached to any, they have the names, but they are in one folder. They are actually, today, they are still in the same folders. So, so as of today, you have not turned over, nor as your attorney, any prescriptions for Cymbalta. Have you checked to see if those prescriptions are still in that folder? Again, it's argumentative, assumes facts well, that Cymbalta prescriptions would be held in this folder. Excuse me. Just object. Do you have... Symbolta is not a triplicate, and most of the time we don't even make copies of those prescriptions. And she said that so three times. No, just deposition. a minute, please, don't do that. She just I'm sorry, answered. would you repeat that again, your counsel, and inter jumped on your answer? Symbolta is not a triplicate, and we, it's more common not to scan those prescriptions. So if you write a prescription for Symbolta, <coughs> do you keep any record 
in your files at all that you've done so? It should be mentioned somewhere, either in the progress note, assessment and plan, or attached to the file. Somewhere it is mentioned most of the time, yes. But no copies are kept? Not necessarily, no. Now we do e-prescriptions and it's easier, but not two years ago. On the first page of Exhibit 10, it shows that this document was sent from Rashid Dusanoff. Do you see that? Yes. Who is that? That was a medical record person. And he was the medical records person at the time that you treated, strike that, was that also the medical records person who was present in February 2010? I think so. There was a change and I don't know the date. There, there was someone else before that on that position. And is Rashid the individual you asked to pull the Terra de Regatis records for you? He was a he is a medical records person, so he's responsible for providing the records. Yes. And is is he the one you asked to retrieve the records? Yes. Do you, you use RDL reference laboratory in your practice in February of 2010? Yes. Were there any documents that you intentionally did not produce pursuant to Exhibit 11? No. <clears throat> okay, marking next in order. Do you recognize Exhibit 12? I've never seen it in that format, but okay. it looks like billing. Let me identify it then. Exhibit 12 is a two-page document entitled Beverly Medical Associates Patient Transaction Report, 
patient name, Tara Diragatis, and then her birth date, record number, account number, and then there's a date range there. Is that correct? Yes. Does this appear to be a document that your office generated? Let me just object. It lacks foundation. She's already told you she's never seen it before. Well, now that she's heard it described, she can answer one way or the other. I'm sorry? She can answer one way or the other now that she's yeah. looked at it. Do not guess or speculate. I have never seen it. My question to you is different, though. Take a look at the information contained on the first two pages. Also in the, in the left side of the first page, it says from Beverly Medical Associates. That's the company you work for, correct? Yes. Okay. And it says sent through eClinical Works. That's the software that you use at your company, correct? Yes. Okay. And then there is a, a date stamp on it of November 10th, 2011, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, having, and it appears to provide different columns of information. In the first column, the name of the provider. Second column, the bill number. Third column, encounter. Fourth column, date. Next column, code or CPT. And the last column, the amount. Is that correct? Yes. Does this look like to you to be a transaction report that Beverly Medical Associated Associates generated in connection with Terra de Regattas? Objection lacks foundation. Go ahead, doctor. Looks like a billing to me. I'm sorry? It's insurance information and billing. Okay. And does it look like this would be information generated by your office. Please do not guess or speculate. It lacks foundation. Go ahead. I have never seen it in this format. I don't even know those documents exist. Well, let's take the time. Let's go through them then. Sure. The first line, uh, that's your name, correct? Yes. And bill number 2015, what does that refer to? Do not guess or speculate. Well, just, she can answer. She yeah, that's okay. I have no idea. Okay. Under encounter 71388, do you know what that number refers to? No. Uh, the next column under date, February 10, 2010. <coughs> that's the date you first saw Tara in your office, is that right? Yes. In the next column, code and CPT. Do you know what CPT stands for? Yes. What does it stand for? Actually, I, I can't remember now. Okay. But you've heard of it before, of correct? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize the number 99245? It's a consultation visit, yes. That's a, that's a CPT code, correct? Yes. And that's a code that, do you determine <coughs> that code or does someone in your office determine that code? Usually, physician determines the code. So, when you see a when you see a patient at the end of the vi at the end of the visit, you code the visit. Is that correct? Usually. Are there ever times when you intentionally do not code the visit? No, not intentionally. If we are short on time, sometimes it can happen the next following day or the day after. Now, this is an office consultation level five. What is that? It's the highest consultation level. That it means that we review records and talk to the patient and discussed, consult, did physical exam, and everything concluded. And is that generally reserved for first visits? Yes. Okay. Then five hundred dollars. Only first visit. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Only first visit. Only first visits. Yeah. And that. Uh, is five hundred dollars what you were charging at the time? Please uh, do not guess or speculate as to the amounts. I do not charge anything. I put the number according to the time I spent with a patient. Is that generally what your practice was charging at the time for that type of visit? Objection lacks foundation. Go ahead. 
we do not charge, we code based on the time spent with the patient. Is that your recollection of what the value of that code is? <coughs> Again, objection, lacks foundation, asked and answered. Counselor, I'm only well, asking her. She didn't work, work for free. How did, how did the 500? But Your Honor, she doesn't what? do the billing. He hasn't established a foundation, don't. but he keeps asking the same question. You can do, you can still Excuse not do me. the billing, you know. But, but you've gotten the Wait, answer. Go ahead. Excuse me. Just it's the highest the level of consultation based on the time spent I'm with sorry, the patient. Your Honor, Go ahead. Saying? She's Excuse answering it. Go ahead. It's the highest initial visit consultation based on the time spent with the patient. And is, is the value of what your practice charges for that $500? Objection, lacks foundation, asked and answered. Go ahead, doctor. If you know, say, I don't. if you have no idea what you charge, that's okay too. I don't. You have no idea, correct? At that time, I actually had absolutely no idea. Okay, no, that's all right. If that's your answer, just give it. Yes, you did. Uh, second one, uh, CPT code 36415, what is that? It's for drawing the blood. Okay. Uh, the next line, CPT code 85651, what is that for? Sed rate. Which is what? Sedimentation rate, inflammation marker. Okay. The next line, 86140, what is that? C-reactive protein. Now, are these tests that you directed the patient to undertake after your first visit? At the first visit, yes. Okay. So this accurately depicts the treatment and the laboratory request that you made of Tara de Regattis following her first visit? Yes. Let's go down to the second box. Do you see 2309 under bill number? Mm -hmm. okay. And you do not know what that is? No idea. And then under date, it says March 1st, 2010. That's the second visit that you had with Tara D. Regattis, correct? Yes. Then under CPT code 99214, office visit, correct? Yes. And what does that say after that? Level four. And before that? Established patient. Okay. So what does level four ninety nine two one four mean? It means that I saw the patient and addressed her complaints. Does it indicate how long you have spent with the patient? Probably in the billing there is time limits, I don't know that. So you have no recollection? No. Okay. Are there other codes that you could put beside, for office visits besides 99214? Yes. Okay. And does it depend on what factors? It depends on the, how complicated the visit was and how long you spend with the patient. Okay, below that, J3301, what is that? It's a code for catalog. For what? Catalog. And what is that? That's the steroid medication. And did you, well, let me ask you the next one. Under mm -hmm. the third row, 20553 inject trigger points, do you see that? Yes. And is that for the trigger point procedure you had with her? Yes. And what is Kenalog? Anti-inflammatory steroid medication. And did you prescribe that for her? No, that's the medication you use for trigger point injections. Like lidocaine? <laughs> lidocaine is on just a pain medication. It doesn't last at all. Kenalog is anti-inflammatory medication. You mix with lidocaine and it lasts longer. So you mixed it with lidocaine? Yes. Okay. The second page, it shows under date, March 22nd, 2010, in the first box, do you see that? Yes. Okay, and that's the third visit you had for Tara? Yes. Uh, going back to the first page, 
that accurately reflects the treatments that you undertook of Tara during her second visit? Again, Lax Foundation, go ahead. I think they actually didn't include trigger point injections. Now what I'm looking at this building, In, they didn't include trigger point injections. They did or didn't? It looks like they didn't. In the second one or in the first one? No, the first one. Okay. But in the second one they did, correct? Yes. So the first one's missing the trigger point injections. It looks like that. Yes. Okay. Let's go to the third page. Now this time it's a 99215 CPT code for the visit, correct? Yes. Which is different from the first two. And what does it say after that? Office visit established patient level five? Yes. And it's $200 this time. Is this a more involved visit than the second visit? It's a longer visit, yes. Is there anything else differentiating the second visit from the third in terms of the coding besides the amount of time you spent with the patient? Counseling time. So, do you provide counseling to a patient in both the level four visit as well as the level five visit? Four is very limited. More limited counseling? Yes. Okay. Is that a yes? Yes. And, and how much time would you spend for the second visit, level four, versus the third visit, level five? Asked and answered. Go ahead. This level four visit, so the level three visit is usually if you address a simple one complaint, if you come with a sore throat and I give you a Z pack, that would be level three. Okay. If it's more involved visit and you address more than one thing or you counsel the patient and it's level four, that's my understanding. And if you spend more time with the patient and counsel more and address other issues, that's level five. And it's your recollection that you coded each one of these visits yourself, correct? I think so. Okay. It also shows uh, 84480. What is that? It's a thyroid function test. Okay. And the next one, J3301. I'm sorry, the next one is what? J3301. Canalog. And that is for the trigger points? Yes. Injection? Yes. Now, was there anything else that you undertook during this? office visit that is not contained on the second page here? <coughs> they should have included venipuncture, but they don't clearly now, feel appropriate. It, is it up to them to include those activities if you've uh, given it a CPT code on your progress notes, or where do you put the CPT code? The question is, some CPT codes have anything to do with it. Go ahead. Lax Foundation. It's usually whoever reviews, the, the, they should know that if we draw the blood, they should also include the CPT code for venipuncture, but sometimes it's missed. Okay. Who would be the person in your office who would be familiar with the dollar value of the charges of the treatments during February of 2010? We have a financial manager. Okay. What's his or her name? Her name is Rocio, R-O-C-I-O. Last name? <coughs> I can't remember. That's okay. Oh, Robles. I'm sorry? R-O-B-L-E-S. Robles? Yes. And this person is still with you? Yes. And they were with you in February of 2010? Yes. And what's their responsibility? She is a financial manager, so she is overseeing the billing and tracking the posting these payments.
Now, it, the posting and the payments on Exhibit 12, that's something as part of the software that you use in your office, correct? Objection lacks foundation. You can answer. If you know. I sure. don't know. I think so. Because when you need it to when you need to find out information involving the type of information that's contained in Exhibit 12, uh, you would simply ask Ms. Robles to provide you with the information, correct? Yes. And she would use the the company software to do so, correct? Lax Foundation may call for speculation. Go ahead. I think so. Thank you. Marking is next in order. Thirteen. Thank you. Thank you. Exhibit thirteen is a lab result, one page dated February, well, at the very top, there's a, an electronic, looks like a fax number saying February 11th, 21 colon 38 by RDL reference laboratory. And at the bottom, it's got a Bates number of page 26. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Is this a lab result that you had asked Tara to undertake in your office? Yes. And what is the lab result for? For autoimmune illnesses. And had you ever seen any other lab results for Tara de Regatis uh, for this same test? I don't remember. I would have to go back and look. And what do the results indicate for you? That she did not have antibodies that would be consistent with some autoimmune illness. Okay. And did you convey to her the, the results of these, the lab work you had undertaken after the first visit? Yes, I and, think so. And how did you do that? I must have said they were normal. Do you do that in between the visits or at the second visit or at what point? The RDL usually takes about 10 working days. If they find something, sometimes sooner. So that's why, that's the reason patient is brought back to the clinic in two weeks so that we can go over the results. This seems to indicate that the results were reported the day after they were taken, correct? Collection date. February 10th, 2010, reporting date, February 11, 2010. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So does that indicate to you that you learned of these results the next day? Not necessarily. Do you have a recollection of providing these results to Tara at the time of her second appointment? I'm positive. Okay. Marking now as e Exhibit 14. Thank you. Exhibit 14 is a two-page document. Bates numbered 17 and 18, and it says Beverly Medical Associates 
cumulative report on the first page. Do you see that? Yes. Do you recognize this document? Yes. What is this? This is in-house blood work. It, it's blood work? In-house blood results. In-house blood work. Yeah. Now, the patient's last name is misspelled. Do you see that? Yes. Do you have any doubt that this is for uh, Terra de Regatis in this case? No. And was this for blood work that was collected for blood that was collected uh, at or about the first appointment? The first page, yes. Okay. And what was the blood work for? To investigate if there was any inflammatory autoimmune condition underlying causing the pain. Okay. And what did the results show you? That it was normal. And did you convey these results to Tara? Yes, I believe so. And was this uh, during the second visit also? Yes. What about the second page, page 18? What is that? It's thyroid function test. <coughs> and this is the a test that you had performed on Tara during her third visit, is that correct? Yes. Is that what T4 and T3 stand for? Yes. And what is TSH? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay. And the first two are, so, are also thyroid tests, correct? Yes. And did she test within the range of normal? For the most part, T3, T4 shows the function of the thyroid. TSH is slightly suppressed. Okay. Did you discuss these results with Tara? It was done at the very last visit. So you did not have these results back until after she passed away, correct? Yes. Oh, no problem. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to finish tonight, so... Uh, we could pick another date. Sure. Yeah. Off the record, 515. Uh, well, that may be a problem. So, how much longer? Back on the record, 527. All right, just for one second, I have just provided a list on request of my available dates clear to the end of August. I have not done it for any purpose other than I was asked. Great, and uh, my available dates are identical with the judges, except for August 22, 23, and 24. We are prepared to proceed with uh, Tuesday and Friday of this week, the 25th and 26th of this week, 31st. August 2nd after 1 p.m., August 3rd, 7th, 8th, 10th, 13th after 1 p.m., 20th after 2 p.m., August 21st, August 27th afternoon, and August 29th and 30th and 31st. So we are prepared to proceed with the continuation of the doctor's deposition. We estimate somewhere between two and four hours, so a half a day. In council, when are you available to continue your deposition? Let me just make a couple of statements. We, uh, Mr. Brown opted to start this deposition at 10 o'clock today for some reason, knowing that he was not able to proceed beyond 5.30. Dr. Shansky, now this is the second day in which she's canceled a full day of patients. She is here today prepared to complete her testimony, whether it be two hours or four hours. 
Um, we have gone over her three treatment visits with the decedent, and now counsel is getting into areas that obviously are not relevant, and I think this is for no other reason other than to burden and harass this witness. We are here again. His honor is here at least until six. There's no reason we can't continue today until six. If there's going to be another session, it would shorten that next session that much more. So I'm not going to provide my availability right now. If we need to, we will meet and confer on that issue. Okay. We will send out a, a notice of deposition with, with the dates in mind. And counsel, you can do what you want to do with it. That's the starting at 10 today. You complained last time that it started at 9.30. You didn't show up until 10.15. And so as an accommodation to you, we started at 10 o'clock today. Mr. Brown, did you ask with that? I'm not finished. Okay. okay. And so with that notice, uh, is there anything anyone would like to add? Yes. Um, you mentioned that the last time we started at 10. Uh, and had 10 I know, hang, hang on a second. Had I known that you were going to prematurely terminate again, the deposition at 5.30, I would have offered to start the deposition at 7 if necessary to get it done today. You never gave me that opportunity, and I'll just leave it at that at this point. Uh, let, the no, let, let, the, let the record reflect there are a few people here laughing at his last comment. That would be one person, Mr. Brown. Thank the you. More than one person, but go ahead. Off the record. There's one snicker and a chortle. There, there, that's very accurate, Judge. Very accurate. This concludes today's proceedings. Total number of videotapes used was three. We are going off the record. The time is 5.32. <coughs> I